Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Sunday talk within the nine sided circle. I am your host, Nor Kyle. And I am her faithful sidekick, Mushtaq Ali. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, whether you're here live or on the replay. We're so happy to have you here. <sighs> another wonderful day in the neighborhood. Um, welcome to uh, our YouTube spiel as well, right? So if you'd like to support our work, and we do work very hard, you can uh, like this video, you can leave a comment, you can share with your friends, and of course, you can subscribe to keep up with what we're doing every week. We don't pretty really much that hard. You we like to hard. think we do. <laughs> you work hard. I'm lazy. I, I just <laughs> go up and talk sometimes. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, other than that, if you want to connect with us elsewhere beyond YouTube, you can find our Facebook page. You can join our Facebook group, which we recommend. And you can join our email mailing list, which we definitely recommend because in this crazy social media world today, you never know when things are going to crumble when you least expect it, right? So that's how we can all stay connected and engaged. What else, Mushtaq? Oh, I, I want to upset somebody by saying you can make donations to us. And the way we prefer to get our donations is that you find money that you didn't know you had because you didn't actually need it. And I especially suggest that you look underneath the, the cushions of your couch and find some spare change or in the center console of your car. Also in your winter coat, if it's summer in your summer coat, if it's winter, check the pockets. If you find anything like that and you look at it and you go, oh, I didn't really need this money, you can make a donation to us. And Critical. for the person who wanted to uh, take us to task for suggesting that, one, you don't have a sense of humor. Two, you don't actually understand prosperity. Damn right. Yeah. I'm not going to flip them off, but I'm thinking it. <laughs> stuck in his craw this week so um other than that yes we do still have one-on-one -on -one sessions open or two-on-one if you'd like to hang out with both of us for about an hour and uh that is one way you can support us and we can support you so send us an email and we will set you up if need if you like with a session with us so that's that. That's Without that. further ado, it's story time again tonight, kids. And we are borrowing a story that goes way back. And uh, we're going to put our own spin on it, right, Mushtaq? Yeah. You know, a little bit. A little bit. We're going to discuss it and take a look at what it actually means versus what uh, some people somewhere else might have thought that it meant at some time or another in the past or not. Yeah. And I think it's a timely story. story. I am pretty sure it comes from the Russia hot out uns. Uh, though I can't, can't guarantee you that, but I think that that's where it, it originates. Um, uh, it is that beads of dew from the... No, that's, that's the, uh, the other one, the, the other one, it, the the breath of the of the the masters or some such thing. Okay, it's the one that we can never find an English translation of. That's an ongoing search. So, this story is kind of for those of us who are in our springtime. I think it's appropriate now. Where should we begin? We should begin by uh, relating the story. What's the title? Um, 
the title. That means I have to give you the title of the talk. There's really no title to the story. This is just a story that is related. And we, yeah. I called it uh, The Fragrance and the Pollen. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. So this is a story of uh, Sheikh Bahawadin Naqshband, who is the uh, the person that is looked upon as the founder of the Naqshbandi order that carries his name. Um, and it took place some 1300 years ago or in the 1300s. So I don't want to do the math right now. So somewhat time, time in the 1300s. So Sheikh Bahauddin <laughs> would, he had a school in Bukhara. And he would do talks. And this is from one of his talks, as recorded by, uh, I think, uh, Atar, his student. Uh, and it goes like this. Sheikh Bahauddin called the Sobat to order. Sobat means a discussion, uh, a spiritual talk. After a short address, on the work, the sheikh asked four questions. Someone asked, what is the greatest difficulty in the learning and the teaching of the way? The sheikh answered, people are drawn to superficiality. They are attracted by preaching, by rumor and report, and especially by that which excites them like bees to the scent of a flower. The man asked, how else are people to approach wisdom or bees flowers? The sheikh answered, the human approaches wisdom through report and rumor, preaching and reading and excitement. After he has approached it, however, he stays near to demand more and more of the same, not whatever it can give, which is what it is there for. Bees approach flowers by the scent, but they do not, once arrived at the, at, the, at the blossom, demand merely more and more of the aroma. They adjust to the nectar, which they have come, come to collect. This is the equivalent to the reality of wisdom, of which the report and imaginings are as if it were just the scent. So the number of real bees amongst humanity is very small, whereas almost all bees are bees in being able to collect nectar, almost all human beings are not yet human beings in the sense of being able to be attuned to perceive what they were created for. Then the sheikh said, let those who came here to this house of Gnosis because of reading stand up. Many of the participants stood. Let those, he continued, who came here, came to us because of hearing about us also stand up. Many also stood. Those who are still seated, he continued, are those who came here because they perceived our presence and authenticity in another more subtle manner. Those who are standing, old and young, include many who only demand more and more of their feelings to be stirred, who desire excitement or calm before they can learn what they cannot experience them experience elsewhere they must require knowledge and not the services of attraction he then said there are those who are attracted to a teacher because of th this repute and who accordingly travel to see him to seek even more of the same sensation same sensation. When he dies, they visit his grave, again, for a similar reason. Unless their aspirations are transformed as if by alchemy, 
they will not find truth. And, he said, there are those who visit a teacher not because they have heard of him as a great living mentor, not because they wish to see his tomb, but because they recognize his inmost reality. One day everyone will possess this faculty. Now, Sheikh Bahauddin said, But in the meantime, the work which will be done eventually through the generations has to be performed in one and the same individual. To become a Moses, you will have to transcend your Pharaoh. The man who is attracted by repute must become, as it were, another man. He must become a man who stays in proximity to wisdom because he has sensed its inmost reality. This is the purpose of the work before he can learn. Unless he has learnt this, he is merely a dervish, a dervish desires, a Sufi perceives. That's the story. And we will refer to various bits and pieces of it throughout our discussion this evening. What do you think, Noor? What do I think? What do you think? You're the smart one of this team. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we all, I think a lot of us, especially in the beginning, we are, as it says, we're looking for excitement or calm when it comes to the things that motivate us in yeah. doing, quote unquote, spiritual stuff. Yeah, or we're looking for superpowers. Some of us are looking for superpowers. <laughs> Some of us are looking for status. This is especially true of Americans. Status. Status. Wow. The number of people, for yeah. instance, who start a martial arts class, not because they want to learn the art, but because they want to get a black belt so that they can show everybody that they're a black belt. That's the status. And this is the same thing. A lot of people come to dervish, to dervish circles because they want a black belt in Sufism. Mm. They want to be the authority, the sheikh, the master. They want have to have everybody recognize them as the one. And if you've ever uh, seen Babylon 5, you know being the one is not all it's cracked up to be. But that is okay, because that's how people get here. Yeah. The question is, mm -hmm. whatever drug you hear, can you let that go to taste something that's real? Austin, did you have a thought? Someone who I was very close to um, would always say, does the work fall on your false personality or does it fall on your essence? And he would say that's like one of the biggest um, like pitfalls. Uh, and for sure, you, you see this a lot in shamanic circles where a Westerner goes and, and something that happened to me as well, like, oh, I want to be the medicine man i want to be the shaman you know and you quickly realize uh cultural appropriation and also just how uh just how intricate these uh different personalities are and uh, yeah i think a lot of people find things enticing and then it's so funny Mushtaq said I'm here for the superpowers <laughs> because it's uh I think I think yeah who, who wouldn't you know in some way shape or form who wouldn't want clairvoyance or uh these things that are promised with uh spiritual transcendence 
Yeah. I'm Thanks pretty so. sure, though, that in actuality, none of those things are promised with spiritual transcendence. Mm -hmm. Those things are promised by those who are the servants of Maya. Mm -hmm. You know Maya? The Hindu goddess of illusions. Mm -hmm. The single, in my opinion, the single most powerful deity in the Hindu pantheon. Out of curiosity, is there an equivalent in, say, the Greek pantheon or any of the um, other? In the Greek pantheon, maybe Eris. Hmm. At least in the modern interpretation. And this would be because it's the most apparent. Yeah. And possibly the most... Uh... Possibly the most depth in terms of what we can actually see and feel and touch. Yeah. Think of you take a trip to, let's say, South America or the deserts of the Southwest, doesn't matter. And somebody says, Here, take this and you'll see the truth. And they give you some teacher plant. And you take the teacher plant. And your mind is blown. You see the truth. At that point, you have a choice to live the truth or to go back and take more teacher plant because it's fun getting there. And the interesting thing is if the teacher plant shows you the truth and you perceive it, you never need to take it again. But it's so much fun. Nancy says, Maya blunts the powers of all the other gods. It is true. What so, else is, sorry, Mushtaq. No, after you. I was just going to invite people to, to say more. James says, I don't understand. Do you want to say more? What do you mean? What don't you understand? Maya blunts the power of all the other gods. What, in what sense, like? In the sense of, let's say that you are a devotee of Shiva. And Shiva is all about radical awakening. You know, they call him, uh, you know, Yoga Raj, you know, the king of yoga. But Maya comes in and says, you know, you could go to this boutique yoga studio. You could wear these wonderful tights you could have this spiritually attuned yoga mat you could do all of these things everyone there is hot yeah everyone there is hot don't forget that part <laughs> I'm to remember that part but I, I, I vaguely remember something about that <laughs> no one there's cup with an ash and drinking out of human skulls and all that kind of fun stuff they're all just pretty uh so Maya dilutes the um or totally distracts from the the impact of the other transpersonal forces or Maya says something that hey I have pretty dreams for you. Yeah. I have the nicest dreams. And what Sheikh Bahauddin is pointing out here, uh, though he's using different words, is that that's what most people want. Yeah. Most and that's what they want in their teachers. Yeah. Uh, part of the dream is to be the great teacher that everybody loves and respects and, and bows down to for a lot of people. Yep. Would follow to the ends of the earth. 
Yeah, I mean that that is such a common fantasy amongst people. It's it's almost unbelievable. You got to hang out in the right crowds where it comes out. I mean, the number of martial arts teachers that uh, I've run across that refer to themselves as Sifu, Guru, Goro, Sensei, Shihan, Fred. They have like... Yeah, 16 yeah. titles, all of which are saying the same thing. Teacher, 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 Fred. But It's like a showcase, you yeah. know? Um, a grubbier example in the neo-pagan occult community is what's been described as mentorship fantasy, where an older man basically is searching for all the younger women and to offer to train them and teach them and da 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 da. You can see where all that's going. Um, I think mentorship is the well, mentor, just mentor fantasy is the um, the common term used to describe that particular strategy. Um, it's i don't know because those communities have more people suffering from social dislocation or awkwardness or whatever but um no it happens with all the other teacher fantasies as well in different areas but yeah, yeah that's where you've seen it yeah research is in this for the guys especially mm. uh getting the hot babes is definitely part of the fantasy the harem yeah Especially if you were never particularly socially adequate growing up, you can never get the women through being sporty or on the top of the social hierarchy. Well, now you can do it through being the uh, the um, enigmatic mystical authority. So it's the same chauvinistic stuff. It's just got a yeah. You know, it's weird. Mm. Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah, I've always wanted acknowledgement and praise and admiration. And, uh, but I've not, I believe I've not let it lead me as, as the goal. Uh, well, for example, I did yoga for like 25 years. I mm. became really good at it, but I didn't, I mean, I, sh I should have been at least have people say, you're really good at yoga and i i some i imagine i could have attended the right kind of classes and got more than people saying you're really good but i didn't go for those kind of yoga classes i rather sought to just find a, a body i could practice with that was on at my level and we just would do it at my house or at their house and because that would have led me astray. I know it. Yeah. Yeah, so you never went for a teacher training? No. And I never sought the classes with the young, pretty women in it. Because that was just... They weren't doing my kind of yoga. So was that a conscious choice or just... The way oh, it worked out was conscious yeah thanks jonathan austin yeah i feel like jonathan kind of beat me to it i i, I sense that in myself as well like this almost wanting uh, praise and appreciation i think i think we all have that inside of us in some way shape or form Oh, we absolutely do. Yeah. And, and I think it's, you know, um, referring to some old Facebook picture, like which wolf are you feeding in some sense? And um, I remember when I first got into the work, uh, I was, I felt so like the need to just tell this one person, this one person that was very close to me. And I remember talking about it and talking about it. Like almost waiting for this for her to tell me like wow this is so cool <laughs> i got the complete opposite reaction and i was like i just wasted my energy here waiting for for approval from that and um it's something i'm glad i'm glad i noticed when i like first got in because even now uh, being a hypnotherapist i have a lot of people who like 
reach out and say thank you and say things like, oh, like you're a healer and this like that. And, and that can easily, easily get to someone's head if, if you're not aware of that. Oh, yeah. And as a hypnotherapist, you're in a great position to add a little influence to what you do. To kind of fuel the yeah. flames. Yeah. Yeah. And that is definitely dangerous. We have seen what happens when one does that. I like to refer people to the old 1930s movie, Svengali. Are you familiar with that? You might have to link that to me. Yeah, Svengali with, uh, God, who was it? Uh, not Basil Rathbone. It'll come back to me, but it's a, a movie about a hypnotist who uh, exerts influence over a street girl and he can put her in trance and get her to sing like the finest nightingale and so her in trance self becomes famous but he exerts more and more control over her and she is less and less of herself until well i won't tell you the movie because it would spoil the plot but i will find uh where you can find it and let you know. Okay. Making a note. We can Spend post about that. Yeah. So uh James Barry is... Moore. Yeah, the old old man Barry Moore. Uh, oh. Yeah, Drew Barrymore's grandpa played Spengali. Right. So to everyone's point about, you know, this tendency being normal and widespread this desire for approval james says all healthy monkeys have a pack instinct the desire to be known by one's pack members to have that reassurance of being seen which in turn comes with the fear of being ignored being cast out yeah relatable content i mean i feel that and that means that I have to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm an animal just like we all are. And that comes up inside of me. And it's good to acknowledge that it's there because treating it as a healthy thing takes some of the edge out of it, takes some of that grasping, needy, demanding power out of it so thank you for that james and for all of you who have copped to that i mean it's healthy to be able to do that and it's normal to want to impress people and to be noticed by the people that you're attracted to, all of those things. It's just how do we hold space for that without letting it control what we choose to do? And it's interesting that, you know, we're talking about we, we read this story and we're talking about from the teacher's point of view, you know, how do you not just serve as a point of attraction to get your ego needs met? You need to allow that to kind of be released so that you can be that, you know, be a resource, essentially. And to be a healthy enough resource so that the people who are coming to you, whether it's because they read cool stuff that you wrote, they heard rumors about how cool you are, they listen to talks you did on youtube that really spoke to them and shook something inside of them and they're like oh my god i want to feel this all the time like you know that's 
a responsibility on the part of the listener and the teacher to see that for what it is and to facilitate that alchemy that's mentioned in the story moving from a state of i want to devour this i want to consume this to i want to grow i want to be nourished in a way that is self-sustaining Yeah, and that becomes the most important thing. Uh, Sheikh Bahauddin uh, outlined the problem pretty clearly, but he also gives the solution. So what do you think the solution is? Funnily enough, I was just about to ask something about that because I was thinking back to the original story and he divided very clearly people into basically two categories or three or whatever, but really two, the people who were just there because they'd heard something and then the people who were there with a genuine something inside but i didn't recall hearing anything about how to get the people from the first two categories into the second now uh, the, maybe the i missed it is mm -hmm. that everybody who is there everybody who comes there almost without exception comes in the first category the people come not because they want true awakening, but because they want whatever Maya says is true awakening. They want the thrill. They want the excitement. They want the delusions. To be comforted. Yeah, they want all of these soothed. things. Yeah. And Bahauddin points out that you have to make the transition of the bee. And the transition of the bee is you let the fragrance of the flower bring you to the flower. But once you arrive at the flower, you must drink of the nectar. And only then can you produce the honey. You must take the pollen, right? You've got to load the pollen up in your little bee legs. You got to fill your tummy up with, with the nectar, and then you have to go back to the hive. That's the metaphor. But as he likes to point out, a if, if it's a human, rather than doing that, <laughs> they uh, They want more of the they want more of the scent. They want more of the aroma. They want more of the fragrance. They want to sit there and smell the flower and be intoxicated by it. And so you have to move from intoxication to sobriety. And if you know anything about the lineage of Bahauddin Naqshband, and the Naqshbandis are known as a sober order, and all of their precursors and our offshoot from their precursors are a sober order. We're not really big on ecstatic states. I mean, yeah, every now and again, an ecstatic, an ecstatic state, you know, falls out of the sky and hits you in the head, but... You're not looking for it. Yeah, you savor it, and then you're like, okay. Yeah. Onward. <laughs> you don't whirl. Uh, if you did whirl, you would whirl soberly, like the Mevlevis. <laughs> People mistake whirling for intoxication. I've, I've talked about this before. It's not. At least not as the meth levies do it. They aren't intoxicated. They are sober, but transcended, is how I would put it. Ah, uh, okay. 
Could you maybe, uh, I'm getting a sense this would be in these ecstatic states, in these states of happiness or joy or uh, wonder. Maybe, yeah, but, but, but just doing it consciously, is that what you're referring to? Just being like, okay, this is, this is what's happening. Yeah, if you hit an ecstatic state, stay conscious through it. Don't go to sleep behind it. And we've seen, because uh, back in the 80s, before the government got hold of it, there was a ethnogen that was... Uh, entheogen? Out, entheogen, yes. That was uh, came upon the scene originally mostly with therapists, which is known as MDMA. And in the right hands, it took therapy from months and years to hours and days. But when used recreationally, would cause these random imprints in people that were not what they were looking for. And a lot of abuse because there is the ecstatic part of that particular substance. And a lot of people were not prepared for that, including a lot of the people who were using it in a therapeutic setting. So there were some big oopsies. Yeah, uh, the, the line between uh, consciousness and falling asleep with MDMA is very, very, very thin. Yes. Yeah, I, I realized that we had created a problem situation when a friend of mine went off to a, 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 a concert, weekend concert, came back married. Oops. Yeah, madly <laughs> in love with this woman because they dropped MDMA together. And the next thing you know, they were, you know, they were soul brothers. And that lasted for about six months. And then it was like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> James says ecstasy crushes and suicide Tuesday the legacy of rave culture yep yikes Ibrahim has a question yeah Ibrahim lay it on us hello hi hello. everybody hi. Um, salam. Uh, uh, salam. a lot of things actually have come up with me based on the story and some of the sharing that I've heard thus far Towards the tail end of that that tale, which I certainly have to rewatch the recording and and really tune in a bit more, there was that line of this difference between uh, a that a, a dervish and a Sufi, and you mentioned the word pre preceptivity, perceptivity. Yes. Yep. And then that led me to really just kind of think of what does the act of trans like true transmutation look like within my own life because there has been many moments where i caught myself either people pleasing um false humility that arose yet quite frankly many of those instances led me to this aspect of dare i say it maturing something about me which i don't know i can't put my finger on just yet and then the other notion that kind of popped up to me is the concept of a bee like and you mentioned an antheogenic such as mdma and actually quite frankly almost any classic psychedelic in this case mm. how like how different would my reality look like if pure intentionality was met with natural survival ship instincts within my existence and would it even be possible to exist in a world like that in this reality and big reality where everything can almost be like you're transcending and including these things without necess necessarily identifying with anything. Does that make sense? There's a lot of things that yeah. have been coming up for me, just kind of hearing everybody express and hearing everybody yeah, share. I, I think you're on the right track there. Let's take a look at that last paragraph because that, yeah. as they say in the biz, this is the money shot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can read the last couple of things. 
So uh actually let me read them because you I know what you edited wanted. them slightly differently. Okay. Go for it. So Sheikh Bahauddin said, but in the meantime, the work which will be done eventually through the generations has to be performed in one and the same individual. To be a Moses, you will have to transcend your Pharaoh. The man who is attracted by repute must become, as it were, another man. He must become a man who stays in proximity to wisdom because he has sensed its innermost reality. This is the purpose of the work before he can learn. Until he has learnt this, he is a mere dervish. A dervish desires, a Sufi perceives. And I really wish I had the original Persian to this mm -hmm. because uh, I, I would like to check on what the words actually are and what they say. Uh, but I have to work from what is likely a bad translation. Beautiful. Um, and honestly, like, again, it kind of painted another, <laughs> another picture for me. Mm. And that picture was if you just take it from a biological level of the bee and the flower, the flower, correct me if I'm wrong here, but evolved over time to be colorful, to attract the bee to, to pollinate. Yes. So there's this beautiful synergy between them. But at the same time, it can possibly be a dangerous thing if the colors evolved for certain things to trap the bee and affect it in order for it to kind of bypass and navigate things in a more smarter way. Which kind of leads me to the question, what does that state look like? Like, I'm just so curious of of knowing what that state that's described in the tail end of the story appear to be. And selfishly, I guess I've learned so much in my life through witnessing. And then through witnessing, I can maybe strengthen certain faculties within myself. And taking that with a grain of salt, like through exercise and movement as one thing. Um, but what is that internal refining process look like with the utmost sensitivity, but more so sincerity to not want to hold on to it for too long? I'm not sure. I have to really journal and sit with a lot of things that have come up, but yeah, certainly sounds these like, are some of the things that have risen. So thank you. That's pretty powerful. And yeah. I suspect that some of those answers are ones that would be yours to discover rather than anyone feeding you an answer. So journaling about it sounds really good. Yeah, and part of the trouble is that it doesn't look like anything. Mm. That's the, the sneaky bit. It looks like a regular person. And the lineage that both we and Sheikh Bahauddin come from emphasize that. Do, don't be special. Don't be somebody who is admired. Don't wear the funny hats. Don't dress in clothing that indicates a particular status. Be completely and utterly normal in all of your actions while inwardly being awake and present and connected to the one reality. Sort of like that. Say more, Noor. I mean, that's part of why it's individual, right? Yeah. Because to be normal means... Well, I guess it can mean being like everybody else, right? That's often commonly what we mean by normal. But I think in this context, what we mean by that is to be human, you know? Don't try to strive to be 
superhuman to be some kind of weird alien with unrecognizable traits that no one can relate to. It's okay to be a relatable human being. In fact, it's desirable because we're supposed to be in connection with one another and not be aloof. The whole solitude in a crowd thing is about being able to hold your own inside of yourself. It does not mean setting yourself apart as especially good or especially bad or anything like that. Does that make sense? Very much so. Thank you. So, Sheikh Bahauddin says, those who are standing, after he had everybody stand up who came there for all of those different reasons, those who are standing, old and young, including many who only demand more and more of their feelings to be stirred, Whose desire excite, who desire excitement or calm before they can learn before they can learn what they cannot experience elsewhere, they must must require knowledge and not services of attraction. I'm going to have to re-edit that at some point, but let me <laughs> read that again. Those who are standing, old and young, including many who only demand more and more of their feelings to be stirred, who desire excitement or calm, before they can learn what they cannot experience elsewhere, they must require knowledge and not services of attraction. Services of attraction. Yeah. All you have to do is watch any of the big gurus. And when I say guru, I don't necessarily mean Hindu do. teachers. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't want to name names because they aren't here to defend themselves. Not that they could. Well, let's talk about like, we don't have to name names. Evangelical pastors. Um, yeah. Charismatic group leaders who really lay on the love bombs and all of that stuff. Yeah, let's let's use evangelical pastors as an example. Uh, years ago, there was a great movie that came out called Marjo. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Marjo old Gortner, school. <laughs> yeah, Marjo Gortner was raised by his parents to be the world's youngest evangelist. That was their shtick. They went around the tent meetings, raking in bucks, and they basically trained him to act out the... Uh... Imagine all the stereotypes of, Amer you know, American evangelical pastors, but in like a little kid. Yeah. And when he got into his 20s, he blew the whistle on them with this movie. He he lifted up the skirts and showed you what was underneath them. Yeah, that's another documentary we can... Yeah, yeah, well worth we watching. Uh, it's illuminating. But what you see is that over and over and over again, people are, become addicted to these sorts of meetings. They come, they whirl, they spin about, they dance, they speak in tongues, they do all of these things which is just their way of getting high. And then at the end of it is the pitch, right? Give us your offerings. Jesus needs your money. Yeah, so they're brought into this vulnerable state and then, frankly, exploited. Yeah. And the pastors will say, well, they're getting something important out of this. And you know, they're getting catharsis over and over and over again. Yeah, as but, Nancy says, co conversion junkies. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, though, 
nothing changes for them. On the other hand, you go to certain quiet dervish conclaves or Christian monasteries of one sort or another, and all they are is transcendence and transformation with none of this. Yeah, Austin says, what man does in his sleep state no longer surprises me. This is one of the problems of being a hypnotherapist is that you come to the conclusion one day that everybody's in trance all the time. I was a good hypnotherapist back in my day because I realized that I didn't need to hypnotize anybody. They were already in trance. I just needed to nudge their trance in a direction that made them feel better or stop them from doing something destructive. Yeah, the equivalent of giving them better dreams. Yeah. And I should say that there is nothing wrong with giving people better dreams. Most of, most people, that's all they want. Mm -hmm. And they totally deserve to have them. People who want their lives to work better, who want to feel better about themselves, who want, want to, to give up trauma, less all pain. of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. All of that stuff is perfectly good. And there is uh, a moral reason to help them have that. And some people want to wake up. Yeah. As someone said in the chat, what I do in my sleep state disappoints me. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's one reason why many of us uh, end up doing the work is because we're stunned at the things that we do. Yeah, that dude, that could be a T-shirt. You could make a fortune off of that T-shirt. <laughs> Bench heads. <laughs> yes. What I do in my sleep state disappoints me. Yeah. It's interesting you say um there's no change when people seek uh just the, the scent of the flowers and i and i was if i go back to um like my desire for approval or admiration if i were to have received approval and admiration then the, ab ab about what i'm actually doing then there's no why would i want to change exactly mm. i'm already doing everything right and i'm getting what i want yeah chicks dig you you got all the money you know strong men look at you in with envy women faint at your feet everybody is trying to force money into your hands yeah why would you change right it's a really good point yeah. That's why we keep you around, Jonathan. Don't let it go to your head, but you you have good ideas sometimes. Praise, praise. We put the praise on you. <laughs> Everybody needs a little sometimes. Yeah. James, did you have your hand raised before? Yeah, it's kind of a bit vague. Um, I'm still formulating in my head. Uh the we've covered the um I won't say false motives, but the sort of uh, the bias survival motives that are presenting as something else. So the desire for powers, acknowledgement, all that. Now, in terms of what really leads you to wake up, how much of it is legitimately a disappointment with oneself or a, a dissatisfaction? Um, I, I have no great mystical accomplishment. I've glimpsed things a couple of times that I think are significant, but, you know, glimpsed. But in those glimpses, which so many people have had as well, um, all that stuff just fell away. It's really cool. Uh, but what's left in its wake is 
a dissatisfaction. Can that dissatisfaction be a valid motive or is that does that carry too much cramped up self-obsession to really take you through? Both, I would Both. say. I think it's a good... I don't want to say it's a good... It's a potential next step motivator, right? Yeah. And this again... Bees are a very important part of this. There's a reason that the Sheikh uses the idea of the bee. And that's contained in the, the next line after the ones that I just read, which I am also going to read with you, for you, to you, at you, <laughs> at around you. <laughs> then he said, there are those who are attracted to a teacher because of his repute, and who accordingly travel to see him, to seek even more of the same sensation. When he dies, they visit his grave, again for, this, for a similar reason. Unless their aspirations are transformed, unless their aspirations are transformed, as if by alchemy, they will not find truth. Unless their aspirations are transformed as if by alchemy, they will not find truth. And he said, there are those who visit a teacher not because they have heard of him as a great living mentor, not because they wish to see his tomb, but because they recognize his inmost reality. One day, everyone will possess this faculty. Yeah, I think that last line was the was the most surprising thing I heard in the story. Um, what was surprising more. about it? In which line? So we make sure we're on the same page. One day, everyone will. Ah, yes, battle. yeah, that stood out to me too. Hold that thought ian yeah I, just, I didn't i didn't really have anywhere else to go with it just that comment about yeah. that particular line and that stands out so i do want to return to that so thank you um as far as this dissatisfaction goes as mushtaq was reading my personal view as i said is that it can serve as a potential stepping stone you know there is this idea of moving from oh i just want to feel good to mm, you know i'm actually i'm not content with that like there's something an itch inside me i need to scratch pulling me towards being something different or you know alchemizing yeah, that's the word of the day, actually, alchemy. Yes, and I like that because you're you're taking what is and you're transforming it. Can you can you do it by yourself or is you need help for that uh, alchemy to happen? You kind of broke up there for me a little bit. Can you repeat that, please? Um, Hold on, Nancy. We'll get to you, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, about the al alchemy, I was, yeah, I was also thinking about that alchemy. Is it, uh, is, is it a work that one can do by themselves or do you need help from outside i was thinking about this is where the it is a work is. that you can do by yourself and it's really 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 hard to do it by yourself you can go back and recreate alchemy oh. from first principles if you want it'll take you a lifetime 
or you can learn from somebody who has done a lot of the work and learn from people who have done a lot of the work and get a jump on it. So it can go either way. Yes. I also thought maybe this where the uh, usually call the grace comes yes. to play too, right? Yeah, especially in the if if we're talking alchemy, alchemy is a very specific process. It's a alchemy is a word that is much much misused in today's society especially today's spiritual world everybody talks about i'm doing this kind of alchemy i'm doing that kind of alchemy and none of them know what they're talking about for the most part alchemy is first the purification and removal of that which is uh unnecessary and then the recombining of that which is necessary into a a perfected state. So and it's not just the old alchemists. Yeah, it's not just transmuting. Then it's refining. Yeah, and transmuting. You don't really transmute. I mean, that's that's what you tell the the king so that they'll give you money, thinking that you're going to turn lead into gold, so you can do your real work, and then yeah. get out of dodge before they figure out that there ain't going to be no gold. Fair enough. Yeah. And if there were gold, it would kill you. Did you know that? If you turn lead into gold, that gold is going to be massively radioactive. And just being around it is going to cause you untold problems. Think about it. Superpowers, though. Superpowers, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what we all want? Let's go. All right. Ah, Nancy. Yeah, I was thinking about that last line about eventually the whole world will have these abilities. Okay, yes, yeah. Which is not the usual thing I think I hear in this group. I mean, usually the attitude seems to be more like those who can hear can hear and it's a very small minority. And that could be, I don't know, true for the present, but it's really not the long term. Yeah. So the long term is things getting better. Let's look at this again. Mm -hmm. And he said, there are those who visit a teacher not because they have heard of him as a great living mentor, not because they wish to see his tomb, but because they recognize his inmost reality. One day, everyone will possess this faculty and that's the faculty mm -hmm. of recognizing the inmost reality of the other specifically and i would go so far as to say everybody possesses this faculty already it's just nobody uses it mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Nancy? Does that clarify anything, or did I make things more confusing? Um, it's not. It, it doesn't help that much because the question in my mind is, you know, for the present, the short run, the assumption is very few people. Well, maybe they have the faculty, but they're not using it. If yeah, they're not exercising, we can look to. Yeah. If we can look to a future where everybody has this capacity and uses it, well, I don't know. That's at least interesting. I don't know if it's anything to worry about mostly or think about mostly. Yeah, it would be nice if that were the case. Mm -hmm. Will it be or not? I don't know. Mm hmm. 
You know, uh, I think that if you asked any of the, the like Bahadian and, and such folks, they might say, everybody is going to face the day of judgment. And on that day, they will know, they will recognize, they will see. Could yeah. mean that. That crossed my mind. Yeah. Um... Yeah, but frankly, that last little bit is above my pay grade. Okay. You know, I my job is not to worry about everybody. My job is just to worry about those few who are working on it right now. And let the big guys worry about everybody. Yeah, I, th I think that, that part of the reason that line stood out for me so much is that Bahauddin was saying that 800 years ago, and yet here we are in a world that is clearly mostly asleep. Yes. Um, and the coming back to the little thing about... Um, Everybody will face it on Judgment Day. That's a really interesting interpretive twist on that. And I wonder, coming back to what you said right at the beginning about wish you had the Persian. Yes, I, yeah. I really do. Translation. It would be very interesting to see whether there was anything in the Persian um, that... Yeah, and there will be, because like, like that. everyone else's writings uh, on this, uh, you know, this and uh, the Nafahat, the Rashiat, were written originally in Persian. So you have to go back to the original language to understand what they're saying. Right. And it would not surprise me if this were a reference to the this classical sense of you know what happens when we die well we we get to, to get a glimpse of the real regardless of how we spent our lives and uh it'll be interesting to see what comes up when god willing we do finally get that <laughs> that book in our hands for us to work from yeah i think this is this or saying that the uh... People are awake when they die, something like that. Maybe, though yeah. I don't know that that's going to be the case. But then I'm not dead, so. Yeah, I mean that's why Mushtaq says, and I agree that that it, obviously that's kind of beyond our ken for the time being. Yep. But perhaps we can report back. We'll see. You know. But Austin ah. had a question. He was, was yeah. A couple of people had their hands up and then put yeah. them down. But feel free to come yeah. back. Yeah, chime in. Yeah, no, I, I was just having uh, difficulty with that last line. So he's referring to the faculty that everyone can make the decision to see, to perceive, to perceive the inner reality. So yeah. with, with any of the great saints, their inner reality, if you believe their publicity, is that they are at one with the divine reality. And my experience is that this is true, but that's just my experience. I have no way to demonstrate that to anybody else. And so you can go to a tomb of a saint and you can go into all sorts of ecstatic experiences and you can talk to his ghost and all of that kind of stuff. Or you can go there and perceive that that saint is just a conduit, a, a, a hollow reed, as it were, uh, that is being blown by the divine. Yeah, but... I seem to recall something like that from uh, the beginning of Rumors Mathnawi, something about a flute. Yes. 
Yeah, that's a little bit mm -hmm. different. That is a little bit different, but these are motifs that come up because yeah. they are, you know, they're precious motifs, we could say. Yeah. The... Jonathan, yes. I wanted to speak of uh, the nectar and, and what the nectar could mean in the analogy. Yeah. But to me, there's there's many types of flowers, so there's many types of nectar. And I, I'm wondering if the the nectar could be the a life experience and that it's the job of the bee to collect and harvest as many life experiences as possible but different there were just as there were different life experiences uh like there were different nectars uh, a life experience for me might have nectar in it but for someone else there might be no nectar in it or vice versa so it's this idea we've got to be sensitive to the innermost reality of wisdom i'm just thinking shouldn't we just be sensitive that to a life experience to know that it might have some value for us and then to 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 extract that value out of the nectar is is the is the process of refining it to turn it into honey and and like leave leave off the life experiences that don't have nectar for us or for value for us and search yeah. for the other life experiences that are more enriching. I don't know if it's life experiences or something else. Um, to stick with the metaphor of nectar, all nectar is of a class, and it is the class of a liquid that bees can drink and not die. Some nectar will give you greater transformation than others. And the quality of the nectar will determine the quality of the honey, which is why uh, there are some bees in certain places who drink from very interesting plants and their honey is slightly psychedelic, for instance. But be that as it may, the job of the bee is to transform the nectar, whatever that is. And that may be life experience. That's as good an answer as any. Uh, yeah. Into honey. And what is honey? That's a, a refined form of energy that's closer to truth. Yeah. Um, in the Surah of the Bee, uh, it's verses 68 and 69. Uh, it talks about that. And it says, God, if I can remember this, this is a slight paraphrase. And the bee produces a liquid of various colors. And within this liquid is healing. And I think maybe a nourishment. I have to go back and look. I'm I'm just pulling it from my memory, and I am old, and my mind is feeble. So yeah, I'm pulling it up now. If that's helpful, but yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Sura, I think Sura twenty six. Yes. Um. So I'll read the the two verses. Yeah. And your Lord inspired the bees. Make your homes in the mountains, the trees, and in what people construct, and feed from the flower of any fruit you please, and follow the ways your Lord has made easy for you. From their bellies comes forth liquid of varying colors, in which there is healing for people. Surely this is a sign for those who reflect. This is a very important sura, by the way, at least for us. Nobody else has to care about it, but we care about this sura a lot. There are secrets here. And we like honey. And bees. And bees. 
Yeah, I think we've did it. We did a talk on this. Um, yeah, somewhere to somebody at yeah. some time. But it is actually, you know, it is not quite a coincidence that Nakshaband was talking about beasts in no, this story. It's no coincidence at all, actually. Yeah. So there you have it. This is this is nice and laid back this evening. Just you know, a few lines from an ancient text which may or may not point to anything useful or interesting to anyone. Yeah. Chris, you've been so quiet, but you're here and we're delighted. Maybe he has. He might be taking Maybe care of El Nino. Yeah. <laughs> we're happy to have you here, Chris. I just want to share a couple of thoughts from the chat. Oh, yes. Chris says, hola, I'm in a van filled with sleeping people, so can't talk right now. Just happy to be here. Well, we are happy to have you. I've been thinking about you a lot because for some reason, my Facebook page is throwing up all of these old images of the area around Superior for the last two weeks. Uh, so every time I see one, I think Chris would like this picture. Yeah. And thanks for taking the time, Chris. You didn't have to pop in, but you did. That's really cool. Yeah, I saw one of those. So cool, says Chris. Yeah. Yeah, I tagged him in one because it was just, it was exciting. It was from like the 1940s or 50s. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from James, which I think is worth the, I think yes. he sort of addressed it, but James asked, is nectar work energy in different gradients? Nectar is the substance from which work energy is produced. Yeah, it's not the end result, but it's what gets you there. Yeah. All right, Austin, take Spiritual care. Spiritual calories. <laughs> spiritual Austin, calories i like that thank you again for showing up we love it every time you're here yeah um and you know austin said i think it's important to show ourselves as much grace as we possibly can and amen to that i want to emphasize as i had previously a couple of times that that is part of the work is being able to do the work while showing yourself grace at the same time we're not here to bludgeon ourselves. We are here to learn and to often learn from our mistakes, right? And the mistakes of others sometimes. But grace is an important part of that learning. Yep. And we got to be heading out too, actually. Yep. So, so Brady Bunch mode. All right. Let me make the Brady Bunch mode. Voila. Yay. Everyone, thank you so much for being here as always. It's been a joy. And uh, thank you for all your lovely thoughts and for just spending time with us. So next week is uh, Two Talk Sunday. So maybe we'll see you twice. In the meantime, take good care and we can wave to each other and everybody watching on the replay. And take, see you soon. Bye. Bye.